This is the Birth, Baby, and Life podcast with Kristen Burgess, and we're talking about how to be both pro-woman and pro-baby in episode number 199. Okay, today we are revisiting pronatalism, especially how it impacts women who incontestably carry the heaviest load when it comes to both carrying, bearing, and raising children. As a single mother of eight, I definitely know this, and so I definitely wanted to address this. If you don't know me, my name is Kristen, and I am a pregnancy coach. I work with mamas all over the world, helping them to enjoy a healthy pregnancy, give birth to a healthy baby during a beautiful and lovely natural birth, and I also work with mamas to help them create a healthy, happy home for their children. So again, Again, last week we talked about pronatalism and a broad overview of it. What is it? Why is it, you know, why is the reduced fertility rate a problem? And we talked about some arguments that you hear uh, against pronatalism and some of the implications just overall for you to think about for yourself and for your children. So this week I want to make the case for pronatalism and for specifically pro-woman pronatalism. And I promised you last week because I just kind of brushed over this a little bit I promised you last week that we would talk about it more. And again, I have so many notes this week, so you're going to see me look down on my notes. But I want to make sure that I'm really giving you what you deserve because this week is especially going to get very practical. I think it's very important for you, and I think it's very important for your daughters as well. So I'm happy to be here talking about this with you. And I want to argue that for women having babies, and maybe a lot of them even, is a win and not a burden. So we know that the biggest driver of demographic decline is unplanned childlessness. You know, I think it's so funny. I love the way that they coined this term in the birth gap documentary because it plays on unplanned pregnancy, which of course has been considered the scourge of everybody forever, I guess. But unplanned childlessness is really uh, an interesting concept to think about. So I hope what this episode can do is, is it can provide points for discussion about especially why it's worth carrying that first child and to provide a map of sorts for women wanting a family. And I realize I might be preaching to the choir a little bit because if you're listening to my podcast, you've probably already had children or you're pregnant now and you're planning a natural birth. That's probably how you found me. But I want to make this case because you may be carrying daughters. You probably have other women in your life. And this is a good thing to think about and just talking points to consider and also to consider as you think about how many children you may ultimately want. Um, This also harkens back to my episode a couple of weeks ago because I talked about mothering being a project. If you haven't listened to that episode, definitely go back and listen to it because I really get into the heart. Um of the intention, ingenuity, innovation that it takes to be a mom and to be focused on creating family culture. Clearly, I have mad amounts of respect for all the moms out there, and especially for intentional moms who are really working to create a culture where their children, their family, themselves, their husbands can thrive. It's a really important thing that we do for society, and I think it's a great and beautiful project. So listen to that episode if you haven't. Um, Before I delve into what pro-woman, pro-natalism may look like, I do really want to share some realities, I guess some caveats, because, um, you know, I share these, first of all, knowing some women are going to look at it and opt out. Like, 5% of women really don't want kids, and I think that that's okay. If you're listening to this podcast, my guess is you're not one of those women. You're probably a woman who wants to have kids, Um, but... You know, I just want to say that some women are going to make that choice. And, you know, what our feminist foremothers worked for was for us to have the choice. And I know that one and done is a thing today. So I know, you know, some women say, well, I want to have one child and that's fine. So these caveats are there. But I do hope that maybe you'll uh, you'll look at this um, and see that what might be a downside of having kids may in the end end up being a great upside. And with that, kind of let's get real, right? So I, I don't want to sugarcoat anything. All right, again, I'm a mom of eight. And like, my kids were at camp last, or a couple weeks ago, and it was like, oh my goodness. When they got home, I was like, oh, it had been nice to have just one kid here for a little bit. So, you know, the truth about pronatalism, the truth about having babies, having a family, having multiple kids, having any kids, is that it does mean sacrifice. We can't sugarcoat that. Uh, you have to prioritize relationship over self-fulfillment. And children are prioritized over some level of freedom. 
You can't likely have the same level of travel, zen retreats, and exercise classes, and that sort of fluffy stuff that really does enhance our well-being, perhaps. Maybe it enhances and furthers our spiritual path. Those things may be limited. Um, and, you know, multiple children is definitely going to limit things. And even, even, for example, your career. You know, the truth is, is I sometimes I lament the fact that I haven't really been able to get the business where I would like it to be financially. But the truth is, is what I want to do with my heart and all my soul is to be there and mother my children. And when I feel the most torn, sometimes I think people look and say, oh, Kristen, well, because I homeschool my kids, you should just put them in school and then you'll have more time to work on the business. But the truth is, is my heart is with them. What I really wish is that I could just, you know, sometimes say, well, I'm going to do the business here and there. And in some ways I have done that. For example, many of you know that I took a long hiatus from podcasting. Everything went after everything went down and abuse left me as a single mom. Um, but the reality is, it's like, I just, my heart is with my kids. That's, that's what I want to do. Uh, so I don't necessarily see it as a great sacrifice or rather I realize it's a sacrifice, but it's one to me that's worth it. Um, but, but, but it's true. And how I rabbit trailed here is that it's true that when you have multiple children, that really does limit what you can do because it does take a lot, even if you're not homeschooling. Because just, you know, dealing with interpersonal relationships and school stuff and their education, homeschooling or not, all of that takes a lot of time. You know, you're really not doing it for you. I mentioned in the last episode the book Hannah's Children, which is a great book to read. And one of the things that they found in doing the study for, for Hannah's Children was that, you know, there's something higher that they're serving. In fact, when they did all these interviews all over, they were in the United States for this particular study. And what they realized was that all of the women except for one family said that they were doing this because they felt like it was important for, you know, religious reasons, because they felt like they were serving a higher power or a higher purpose. Um, and sometimes it was a cultural heritage thing. There are some words about that in the book that are just so beautiful. Please read it. And, and they wanted to be open to God's blessings, God's timing, or they wanted to continue this cultural heritage. For the odd family out, the husband happened to want a big family. He loved kids. And so the wife wanted, she wanted to make her husband happy. So even in that situation, you know, there was, there was this wanting to do it for a greater reason. Maybe if you really jump on this pronatalist bandwagon, you think you're doing it for all of humanity or for human flourishing. But usually the truth is, is that women who choose to have multiple children at least, they aren't doing it because it's something on, uh, you know, their life plan list that they want to have a child. They're doing it because they feel like they're doing it for a higher purpose. And so that, that brings with it intrinsically a level of service. Um, and then another truth is that really what's best for children is to have married parents who are focused on the family culture. And I say this as a single mom, totally supportive of single moms. I'm even supportive of moms who come to me who are single moms by choice. But but what we know is that children really flourish in a family unit. And so prioritizing not individual development, but rather prioritizing the family, the marriage as a relationship in a unit in the family as a family culture, jumping back a couple episodes, is really important. It's not necessarily about providing children with expensive opportunities. I touched on that a little bit in the last episode. You know, it's about experiences and belonging and family traditions and the family culture that you develop for your children, being involved in their education, whether you homeschool or you're uh, choosing a public or private school education, but being involved in that education, uh, sharing culture with them like art and music and discussions about current events and that sort of thing on a developmentally appropriate level. All of that is what really nourishes children, and most of that is low cost to no cost, especially introducing children to culture, because there's so much rich cultural heritage that is available literally at our fingertips in books and music and the on the internet, and even many museums and galleries are free or low cost. In fact, in, in my state, in Michigan, um, if you're a low-income family and you're receiving state assistance, you can go into most of the museums and other attractions in our state like that, like uh, you know cultural venues, art galleries, and that sort of thing, at, at low to no cost. Like we're talking like nothing or a dollar a person. So those experiences you're able to give to your children. And that's really what what matters. That's really the richness is being involved in their education, being involved in their lives, being around the dinner table together every night and and having these rich family traditions like holidays for your faith tradition or patriotic holidays, those kinds of things. And what we know is that, you know, universal pre-K and free daycare isn't best with chil for, for children. The results are unequivocal. Being with their mother is the most important. Now, if we look at policy, family policy from a pronatalist perspective, we can see that fertility rates bump a little bit for both 
uh, state subsidized daycare and for a longer paid parental leave. And so my argument, this is purely my argument, is that, well, let's, let's have more leave for moms so that they can be with their babies and incentivize mothers being with their babies. Because we know at least in early childhood, that's best. Now, once you've got older kids who are like kindergarten school age, they can be away from mom for a time. And Susan Venker, who we'll come back and talk about in a minute, um, you know, she talks about this a lot, that it's really those early, that early years window, that is the window that is the best for you to prioritize being there and present for your kids and, and recognizing that that's a sacrifice that may be the ideal sacrifice to make. Um, and I know that it's not really popular in our age of divorce and I'm sitting here like, you know, having gone through really, really rough times myself. So I am definitely not condemning any woman, but you know, this focus on family and focus on preserving the family and, uh, and looking at how do we sacrifice to, to have a family unit to raise our children in isn't super popular in the age of no fault divorce. And, and I say this again, having struggled with my own divorces and, and knowing that sometimes it really feels difficult and, and making decisions and that sort of thing can be heartbreaking for everybody. But I think when we look at culturally, um, a culture where we say what's best for children is to be in a two-parent family, it, this just kind of falls in line with what I was saying before. Is I, I want to say right up front on this episode that there are definitely sacrifices that come with this perspective. Um, and again, re- revisiting the daycare question, you know, we know that that daycare outcomes are poor regardless of the child's sex, regardless of socioeconomic outcomes. Um, And family-based daycare where your child is in a small in-home care setting with one care provider, that's different, so that might be something. But really, what matters the most is time and your child bonding with you as a primary care provider. So like if if your child is in the nursery while you're at the gym, for an hour or two a week, that probably doesn't matter. Or grandma coming and taking care of your child for a few hours a week, that's fine. But that that doesn't have the same effects as day after day, all day daycare. But children really need that secure connection. And if you're listening to this podcast, I probably also don't really need to convince you of that. Um, And again, Suzanne Venker has done a lot of talking about this, and we'll come back and talk about her a little bit more. But if you want more, I'll link to her resources in the show notes for you. So like I said, there's a lot of sacrifice. So I started out this episode giving you those caveats. You've heard all that. You know that I said that I was trying to be fair and balanced, but, but, but I also want to argue that what you've been sold is a lot of lies. Okay. So I got all the caveats out of the way. I emphasized that it was sacrifice, that there are some women that we know just don't really want to do this, but I want to argue that women in general have been sold a lot of lies. Like I mentioned in the last episode, we've kind of been told that humans are bad, that children are a burden. There's this argument that children are a burden to the earth and to the environment and to society and most especially to the women whom they're holding back. You know, there's there's this level of being told that, you know, our babies are against us and that babies uh, take away the opportunity to find our meaning or to chase our bliss. They take away our opportunity for wealth or prestige or status or comfort or whatever. But... You know, the message, you know, it's really an insidious message, like, even if it's not that overt, and it's always there, like, oh, you'll lose your sleep with your children, or they're too expensive, or this, that, or the other. So that message is always there, and it's always framed negatively. And I guess the first thing that I want to say about that as we look at this, like, being pro-woman and pro-natalist is is first challenging, like, acknowledging the challenge And then straight up challenging that the challenge is a bad thing, if that makes sense. Could challenging circumstances actually promote growth? Could those difficult circumstances actually make you a better woman and help you find fulfillment? The progressive position in society today is that we need to end all struggle, that we need to end all pain and all suffering. And, and you know, I'm all for, like I said in the last episode, human flourishing and all for human innovation and ingenuity that helps as much as we can. Like my heart goes out. For example, one of the midwives who has assisted at my birth is a midwife in Haiti. And my heart goes out to the suffering of many of those people in Haiti and especially the struggle for those women and babies. But... You know, the reality is, is that struggle can actually improve us. You know, it's like that thing, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And we know that that hardship and persecution in the past 
in people groups has actually seemed to increase birth rates. And so that makes you sit there and go, hmm, well, maybe it's not a bad thing because people go through all these difficult situations and then what do they do? They have more babies. So are they just asking for more pain? No, there's something good there. People who move through challenges, even trauma, even trauma, come out with more resiliency. And it, and it really seems to matter to the person. There's been some really interesting studies done on childhood traumas that show that if people go through legitimate childbirth or childhood traumas, you know, ones that can be verified, say, by court records that show abuse and that sort of thing, but those people feel like they're resilient and they've done well and they've overcome that trauma, then that trauma will not have a poor effect on them. What also seems to be true is if people have perceived trauma, even if that trauma isn't independently verified, but they perceive it or claim it, and it may be legitimate or it may not, those people are deeply impacted by their trauma. So it really seems to be the person. So really, part of the way is like how you look at this really seems to matter a lot. And I think it's the same with children. It's like children are a challenge and certainly can be a tiring challenge. But Having children isn't really limiting on you. It's not limiting on what you can learn. It's not limiting on what you can grow. I'm a mother of eight and I continue to learn and grow and study. And, you know, I'm thinking about looking at all these different courses that I want to take that study all these things. I want to take a course on Jane Austen and I want to look at a course on, um, you know, on uh, diet. And I want to look at a course on what's happening to our boys today. Like these are all courses that I've looked at the course descriptions in the past couple of days. Like I want to learn all this stuff. And my kids have learned to love the library because they see mom get interested in a topic and go to the library and check out like 40 books on that topic and bring them home. Right? Having children doesn't limit that. I mean, I feel like in many ways I'm living proof of that. And, you know, no matter how many people say that I'm special, because I'm resilient and have been strong and keep learning and keep going even after everything that has happened to us. The truth is, is I'm a normal woman. Like I'm just a regular woman like you. I've just chosen to get up and to keep going and to do that again and again. I've chosen to keep learning. I might not be climbing corporate ladders, ladies. I'm not making any false statements about that, but I'm always learning. I'm always engaged in the world and issues. And, and I, by the way, I also really do like homemaking and homeschooling my kids. And I personally feel like making a beautiful home and being in the kitchen and that sort of thing is a lot of fun. So I've got a bit of a Martha Stewart flair as well. But again, I also love like just learning and engaging and studying business and all kinds of other things, midwifery, of course. And, you know, like I said a couple weeks ago, raising children, creating a family culture, creating traditions, advocating, studying, learning, growing, all of this stretches you. And you also get beautiful babies in the mix. Mothering is not unskilled labor, as I said a couple weeks ago, nor does it need to hold you back from developing as a person. So a few broad thoughts, and then we're going to just really get very practical on what does this mean to be a pro-woman, pro-natalist, or how could you make that happen in your life, or how could you talk to your girls about possibly having this in their futures. <clears throat> You know, ultimately, it's the families who are still having babies who will be here in the future. Because the others, you know, those other heritages and family lines are going to are gonna die out. So ultimately, it's, it's those people who are having babies who hold the future in their hands. And, and we need to ask, should we care about that future? Some people say no. Some people think that extinction is best, the human race should go away, that the world would be better without us. I don't have that feeling. Because again, as I ended last episode with, I believe that people matter, that human life has inherent value, that we have a spark of the divine, that we were fearfully and wonderfully made. And we're not here because we're just somehow more intelligent than other life, but but we're here because a creator. And he created us. He created us with variety. He created us with spice, with verb. You know, he created us. I am like, you know, I am spicy kid who marches to her own drummer still. And when we think about that gift of life that we've been given and this creativity and this opportunity to learn and to grow and the legacy that we are leaving for our children, like who are we creating all this for if it stops with us? I mean, on some levels that does feel a bit selfish. Should it really stop with us? So just think about that again. That's just broad thoughts. So let's talk about what I believe pronatalism does not mean for women. I do not believe that pronatalism in any way means forced birth or Handmaid's Tale. Uh, disclaimer, I haven't actually read Handmaid's Tale, but I'm guessing the gist of it is like forced 
marriage and birth to perpetuate whatever this society was. It is not that. Pronatalism is not that. Pronatalism is also not barred access to contraceptives. I'm, I'm not going to talk about abortion in today's episode. You'll notice that I, I just really haven't brought that up at all um, because I believe that it deserves an episode of its own, to be honest, to discuss the complex web of arguments that have been woven to really turn women against having children and to believe that they're incapable of being mothers because that's, I believe, a lie that especially we're selling low-income women. Um, and there is a dedicated episode coming up to that. But I don't, I don't actually think that's really part of what's going on with this whole uh, unplanned childlessness issue. I think it's more the narrative that we're feeding women overall and the narrative that we're feeding young men and young women overall. So, yeah. And again, Japan, I, I mentioned Japan in the last episode because it's a good example of much of this. And Japan is a good example for this point because contraceptive use was not allowed in Japan until I think the 90s. And they started having a, do a population decline in the 70s. So I don't think it's contraception or abortion or anything like this. So this isn't about telling those women who really and truly don't want to have a baby or don't want to have a baby yet uh, that you can't do that. Because I think having those things is an okay thing. But, or at least contraception is an okay thing. Again, I'll talk about the complexities of abortion in another episode. But... But I do think that we need to talk to women honestly about the implications of using those things to delay childbearing, which might result in unplanned childlessness. So this is also not women being forced out of the workforce. It's not women being kept from education. Like I just emphasized, I love learning. And again, it's not about hogging resources. It's not about being supremacist. Large families are not resource hogs. Um, Rachel Liu, who wrote an article I'll link to in the show notes, uh, she wrote in the National Review an article about natalism, which is another name for pronatalism. And she, you know, she said some people will make that accusation. And that's just really not true. Again, I think that we can learn to raise humans, even a bunch of them, in a way that is sustainable and beautiful. And many families are working towards that now. Many people are working towards that now. Um, and most women who choose to have large families believe that they're serving a higher good. They believe that they're serving God. They're serving a loving relationship, human flourishing, their children. They're, there is not some supremacist or nationalistic agenda going on here. Okay, so with that, we're going to jump into really practical, like what does this look like and how might you make this happen in your life or talk to your daughters about making it work in their lives. Okay, let's start by talking about self-image and societal image. Because as we talked about a couple podcasts ago, mothering is an incredible project. So first, the first thing I want you to do is consider your self-image. Um, as soon as you stepped on the kindergarten assembly line, I guess, the kindergarten uh, belt, you are in a kindergarten to career pipeline. Achieving a career is what you were told defined your worth. Opting out of that or delaying that intentionally, it might cause you to recalibrate your worth. It might, it might cause your self-worth to take a hit and to take even a societal hit. Because think about it. If you've been told from the time you were in kindergarten up until you started your career or graduated from school or whatever that you know your worth was going to be defined and your purpose and your fulfillment was going to be found in this career that you have and there's really no talk about your family or the family life is considered kind of an accessory to that and then you say i'm going to step off of that treadmill and do something different your self-image could take a hit and I don't know if you've ever thought about that or conceptualized that before, but I can tell you that even as a woman, I've had eight children, I've been a stay-at-home mom, even with everything that I went through, if I went back again, I would, I would, I mean, I might make some differences, but fundamentally, I would still choose to be a stay-at-home mom. And so I'm like, I am the statistic that, that women warn their daughters about, right? You know, oh, you want to get an education and everything so that you don't end up alone and having to do it all yourself with nothing. Like, I am, I am that statistic, and I would still go back and be with my babies, right? But even having said that, like, I think probably the biggest struggle of my adult life has been feeling a low self-worth because I've never been able to make the amount of money that I feel is what I need to make. And in reality, that's kind of nebulous, right? But I feel like I've never been super successful in my business. I've never been 
super successful in a career because I've never really had a career, right? I've done like side gigs here and there. And so that's really been a struggle for me. And it's been hard for me to figure out how do I define my self-worth. It's like people will tell me, oh, Kristen, you're so strong. You've done so wonderfully. Look at your beautiful children. Look at how well they're doing. But I still have trouble saying, yep, I'm awesome because, well, I haven't had financial and career success like the world tells you. So that message is really insidious and really pervasive and it can really hit to its core. Is something I struggle with. So that one is one that I want to bring up right away. And it is a practical step because it's really something you have to realize might impact you and might be a struggle if you choose to say, I'm going to have babies or I'm going to put this on pause while I go have babies. So with that, what are solutions that promote babies and women's fulfillment? And I like the idea of sequencing. And there's actually a book from the 80s. I'm looking here to see if I have written down the author and I don't. I think her first name's Arlene. I'll have it in the show notes for sure. But she wrote a book in the 80s called Sequencing. And it's a great book because she talks in the book about that, you know, you can have it all, but not all at the same time. And this is something we'll hear echoed from Suzanne, whom I'm going to talk about again in a minute. And so think about it. You... And the sequencing really matters. The order matters because biological clocks are a reality. They matter, right? So you can have this career and do all of this, but the sequence may need to be changed because you may need to prioritize having your babies and being home with them at least until they're school age over doing your own long education and career and then getting to the point where A, your fertility may be a problem, and B, you may not want to take a career hit or hiatus, or some women find themselves in the situation, and again, Suzanne Venker talks about this a lot, so if you're in this situation, she's a good person to listen to, you may find yourself in the situation where you're the high earner, you're the one who has the health insurance, you're the one that has the well-paid job, and your man maybe isn't quite to that level. And then if you're the one that wants to be with the babies, what do you do in that situation? So these are things to think about. And again, this is something that's really important to think about with our with our daughters. And I also want to argue that I don't, I no longer believe that taking time out to have your babies puts you behind. Maybe you will never have the lifetime earnings of a man who doesn't take time out. But I also don't necessarily believe that that has to be something that cripples you later in life, that you don't have total lifetime earnings. Because again, why do we measure our life's worth on our lifetime earnings anyways? But the reality is, is it doesn't necessarily put you behind. You can go back to school literally at any point when you want to and continue your education. And you can begin a career, and oftentimes you will bring something to a career, especially once your children are older, and there's like not necessarily the risk to the employer that you're going to jump back out of the workforce to have babies, but rather you've got all school-age children or your children are grown and you're kind of free to have your own career. But, you know, you can work your way up or you could find careers where your wisdom and expertise are actually an asset because once you've raised up those children, you know, you're a smart cookie unless you've just sat around eating bonbons and watching soap operas. And I really don't believe that's what women do when they stay home with their babies. So people on their deathbeds don't talk about the raises that they missed. They talk about relationships. And so that's something to really think about. And then even when we think about financially, I like thinking about the FIRE movement. If you haven't heard about the FIRE movement, that stands, it's an acronym that stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. If you look that up, you'll find a world of resources, but I'll link to a few that I like. The reality is, is that you can absolutely catch up. And one of the things that the FIRE movement does is it tells people, of course, it's getting some young whippersnappers who are like right out of high school and college who are going to go all in on this and everything. But one of the things the FIRE movement does is work with people who are like, realize partway through life, oh my goodness, I've done nothing to prepare. I don't know what to do. And they'll tell you that you absolutely can catch up. There is so much that you can do. So if people can do it in the FIRE movement, then, you know, you can do it too. And you can even go join Facebook groups and stuff for the fire movement and learn more. So you may have those lower lifetime earnings, but you also have riches in other ways. And also maybe you benefit with this strong family culture that reverses today's trend of kind of believing parents need to be left on their own or that we don't have any duty to parents or that kind of thing. You know, maybe, maybe our generation that focuses on having babies and treasuring them and, 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 
refocuses on that family bond is a group that looks again at multi-generational households and that sort of thing. And that's, you know, that's even further outside the scope than I want to go on this podcast. But it could be that the riches that you earn give an exponentially larger return than those dollars, many of which I will argue with you ladies, many of which might be wasted in frivolous ways. I remember when my baby, my big babies, the ones who are now all adults, were little people. And we went to this church before we moved to Michigan. And I can remember one of the women crying. I can't, I think it was when my Brennan was a baby. And she had a baby who was he, a baby boy about about Brennan baby's age. And the lady's bathroom had like a lounge area attached to it. And there was a speaker. So you could sit in there and listen to the sermon while you kind of bounced grumpy babies on your knee or whatever. And so we would often end up with ladies in there and she was crying on this Sunday because she didn't want to go back to work because she wanted to be with her baby. She had two older girls. She wanted to be there when they were home from preschool and stuff. And she wanted to be with her little new baby boy. And she was crying because her husband was insisting that she go back to work because she worked as a pharmaceutical representative and made a lot of money. And he really wanted a new boat and this, that, and the other. And I just always thought about that. And maybe there was more to the situation, but I always think about that. It's like, you know, what is a boat? to those priceless years with her baby. And I thought his priorities were wrong. And one of the things is I think a lot of young men today have been conditioned by the same thing as women. And also they don't have the same biological drive to be with their babies. So in some ways they're like, yeah, what? So what if somebody else takes care of the baby in childcare? So what? Um, Because they just don't have that same, they don't have that mama instinct because they're not mamas. But, you know, again, you can absolutely catch up financially. You can do good things. You can follow the Dave Ramsey baby steps plan on one income. You can you can follow the fire movement and get your retirement sorted out. And then, you know, marriage is a good thing too. And being able to prioritize that and give fuller attention to that is a good thing. And again, I, again I'm speaking here as a single mom in the wake of abuse. And I, I still feel like you know, marriage is a good situation. It's certainly proven by research that it's a good situation for your children. And I think for most families and figuring out that juggling um, and how both spouses can find some level of fulfillment. Um, Laura Vanderkam, I don't have her in the show notes right now, but I'll add her in. You know, she does a lot of writing on women and productivity and, and she writes a lot about working women too, but But she talks about like finding fulfillment while you're busy in the midst of parenting. And I think that that's there. And again, like I mentioned a minute ago, higher education is still there. Even if you're doing sequencing, even if you're putting some things off, putting a hold on higher education is okay. Prioritize your marriage and family. You can go back and get the degree or the master's degree. You know, I finished my bachelor's degree (laughs) because I got pregnant with Cassidy in my freshman year of college, dropped out of college. I went back and finished my bachelor's degree 20 years later, <laughs> um, but I did it, ladies, and I feel really proud of it. I have a paper on the history of, of, of uh, birth and midwifery and especially women's voices in childbirth. I wrote my thesis on that, and that is published in a journal. I'm super proud of that, and I'm super glad that I did it when I did it because I, I gained a lot as an adult student. I gained a lot of perspective. You know, higher ed is there, and the faculty just cheered me on. Like, they were proud of me. Nobody was there shaming me. They were just proud of me. It was awesome. Also a little bit stressful while juggling being a single mom, but it was fun. And it was a good thing for someone who loves learning. And, you know, you could do the same thing. My mentor in the single mom organization in my area, you know, she did the same thing, an abuse situation that left her a single mother of seven. And she went back to school. And now her children are all adults. And she's got this uh, job doing social work and working with families that she really loves. And so, again, you know, those opportunities are there for you. And the wisdom that I know that she brings to those families that she's working with because she's working with families who are at risk is great. So the wisdom that you gain and bring through your experiences in your life are going to help you. Both the challenges, like I talked about a few minutes ago, the challenges help you grow and also the positive things and, and, and what you learn will really help you. Now, I also think that one of the benefits of being a mom is, especially if you're listening to my podcast, you're probably interested in natural mothering and that kind of thing, natural health, natural birth. 
if you've listened to any of my other podcasts, you know that I really emphasize working on your health as a mom so that you can have the birth experience that you want, so that you can have a rich and abundant milk supply and that kind of thing, and even optimizing fertility so that you can have babies. If, if you took my fertility class, and if you didn't, it was really, I'm really proud of the fertility class that I did at the beginning of the year. I'll link to it in the show notes in this episode too. But I did so much digging and learning and researching, again, that continuing education, And I learned so much about how you can boost your fertility and all of those things boost your health overall. So I believe that, you know, I believe that being pro-woman can be being pro-fertility, being pro-pregnancy and birth. Those things don't have to be depleting or terrible. I do think that all women should take a lying in period after birth because, honey, you deserve to be pampered. But it's not because you're an invalid or becoming weak because of what you're doing, because of what you're bringing in life. And, and science is starting to back this up. Like research is showing some amazing benefits to women for having babies and long life, even in brain function and cognition and bone health and that sort of thing. So I believe that, you know, optimizing fertility and optimizing for pregnancy and birth has a net positive effect on a woman's health. And I also, you know, if you've listened to anything, I certainly believe that empowering and beautiful birth experiences enhance women's lives and help them to become, you know, mama bears and warrior women and stronger and more confident in yourself. I could go on and on and on and have gone on and on and on about all that stuff. So, you know, I think that those things are a net positive. And I... I I, I think it's a good thing. Now, I do want to address child spacing because I don't necessarily want to equate pronatalism with just like popping out baby after baby after baby with no gap. Um, I do think that having some child spacing is a good thing because it's a benefit to your health. Maternal infant health, breastfeeding, all of those things tend to go better. Um, but I think that you can do that intentionally, number one, because not all women, but most women will experience a lapse in fertility naturally if they are practicing what's called ecological breastfeeding, which is just really baby-centered attachment parenting, baby is with you nursing all the time, breastfeeding. And that that gives a natural break and a natural spacing. But again, if we go back to the book Hannah's Children, where all of the women in that book had five or more children, and many of them had indeed intentionally done some spacing using um, you know, fertility awareness or natural family planning, depending on what you call it, and that sort of thing between babies to space children. So I think that spacing children can be a good thing. Dr. Price, the dentist who studied traditional cultures way back in the 30s and looked to see how robustly healthy they were compared to more modern peoples, he noticed that there seemed to be intentional child spacing in many of those cultures as well. So I don't necessarily, and those cultures ended up having a net lot of children. So I don't think that you need to necessarily throw the baby out with the bathwater, no, maybe pun intended. You can do some child spacing, but I, but I want to say that I think that Overall, a woman's health can benefit from childbearing if she, you know, if she doesn't listen to the standard pregnancy advice. You know, I, I don't want to toot my own horn, but listen to what I talk about with pregnancy nutrition and pregnancy health because it's evidence-based. And there's people like Lily Nichols who are also doing evidence-based work on this. But your health can, can benefit from your babies, not just your fertility and ability to carry more babies, but your lifelong health, including cognitive health and happiness perhaps as well. Um... You know, so looking at another practical thing is, is can we change culture? Can we shift culture to make parenting more rewarding? And I touched on policy a little bit in the last podcast. We do know that some policy seems to make a difference, i.e. providing daycare or longer parental leave. I personally am in favor of, of parental leave, particularly for mothers, because I believe that's what's in the best interest of the child and the mother and in creating a family culture. I don't believe that putting your baby in daycare, the evidence just does not back that up as being good for the baby, even if it does seem to perhaps raise birth rates a little bit. Um, But cash incentives and that sort of thing don't really seem to be motivating in the long run. Hannah's Children says that, um, you know, it doesn't seem like any family policy has really shown to work in the long run, but I do think personally that having uh, social systems that encourage parenthood and that celebrate that and that give benefits to parents as far as tax incentives and that kind of thing are a good thing. Um, Simone Collins, remember Malcolm and Simone that I mentioned, talks about removing unreasonable restrictions on parents. So, you know, like um, not 
calling the police if a child is playing alone at the park when, you know, they're a reasonable age to do that, or having onerous regulations. I, there's actually a really interesting paper that Simone brought my attention to that shows that as car seat restrictions got, got stricter and stricter, people started having fewer babies, which is really interesting. You know, correlation doesn't always equal causation, but the article that she shared makes a really compelling case. So, you know, it could be that we need to look at our policies and ask how child-friendly they are and also how parent-friendly they are because free-range parenting seems to be a good thing for children and for parents. Like, we don't want, you know, helicopter parenting is not sustainable, and that seems to be one of the problems today, perhaps, with thinking that parenting is a burden. But we don't want helicopter helicopter parenting. A really cool way that we can possibly increase birth rates and make this more fun for everybody is that seeing families, large families enjoying life becomes an intrinsic motivator. So in our society today, uh, there's definitely a bit of a division. We just don't see children as much as we did in the past. And I think that feeds into a negative spiral. And when you look at cultures like, for example, Israel. I don't think I've mentioned Israel yet. Israel is the only developed nation that has a positive total fertility rate, a total fertility rate that is above replacement level. And one of the theories for that is that big families are seen often in Israel, which becomes a self-reinforcing positive spiral. So when you see big families everywhere enjoying things, or I even think about the families that, that load all the kids into the RVs and go traveling and that kind of thing, or, you know, they're living as expats in all these beautiful exotic locations, or, you know, they're they're doing fun things with their family, maybe they're influencers or something, and you see all of these people with big families. And I know we could argue about, oh, you know, do we need to parade our children around? But I do think that having some families that are modeling that big families can have fun and can be happy and can go do things helps make more people consider having families. And then again, like kind of living large on less is a good thing. I do think that some of these issues, because we haven't really touched on men yet, so I had men in my notes here, some of this lies with men. Like, why are young men struggling so hard? Why do young men seem to have so little vision and drive? Um, having women competing with them rather than needing them as providers definitely seems to have been a blow to the collective male psyche. Um, and, and asking what is the answer to this, I think, is one of our practical things. I'm the mother of five sons, so, and one of my sons really seems to be struggling with this, one of my adult sons. So I'm very interested in this answer, but I, I don't completely know. I do think that sequencing is a possible answer because that solution allows the man to be valued for his ability to provide while the woman is at home with the young children. And then maybe they're both on a career path as the children are in school. And that might be helpful. Um, and I also think we need to stop disdaining men for being men. Like we teach boys, or society teaches boys, that masculinity is toxic. But the truth is, is there is a place for chivalrous men. For the man who wants to provide, who wants to excel to become better for his woman and, and, and for his family. I think there needs to be balance. But I can tell you as, as a single woman that I think the world needs chivalrous men. You know, it is tough doing it all on your own. It's not glamorous. It's 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 not usually fun. Um, so there's a place for that. And I think we need to just acknowledge that as we talk about solutions overall. Ultimately, I'm speaking to you ladies. and But I encourage you to ponder this because it affects your sons. And I think men certainly need to be part of this too. And certainly they hold some culpability for being bores at times, as in B-O-O-R-S. Um, but I do think it's something that we need to think about and think about how has making men unnecessary impacted them and, and, and at the same time perpetuated this negative spiral of not having men who are worthy of being providers and being family men and thus contribute to the problem of, of there not being families. All right. Let's get really practical here. So Suzanne Venker, who you've heard me mention several times, I'll link to her YouTube channel, and she's also got some great books. I really like her roadmap. She's got a book that's specifically on this now, and she talks about how you need to plan for marriage and family now. So especially if you're a young woman and you haven't had children or you're early in your life or you're talking to your high school, college-age daughters, now is the time to think about this. Prioritize marriage because, yes, this is a thing. Value marriage. Value growing together. Consider the partner issue because as I mentioned in the last episode, getting a partner gets harder as you get older 
In your 20s, again, you grow your lives together. But in your 30s, you're trying to kind of match somebody to the life that you've already built. I also like the advice, you know, think about when you're looking for a man. And I know a lot of you are already married or partnered. But again, talk to your daughters about looking for successful men. You know, smart girls marry rich, right? So marry a man who is focused on being a provider or who has the potential to be the provider. Like I said, I, I think I can't remember if it was in the last podcast episode or this one that I recently read an article about, um, it was in the Wall Street Journal, and it was about these young men who are HVAC technicians in New York City. And, you know, the, those young men are on track to be making $170,000 a year. And one of them was talking about how he wants to buy a little homestead outside of the city. And he's probably going to be doing some long hours for sure, but he's going to be able to provide a good life for his wife and his children. And if she wants to stay home while the children are young or even homeschool, he'll probably be able to provide for that. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to wor worry about marrying an executive or an engineer or something. It could be a blue collar worker because as we have fewer babies, blue collar workers are going to be making more because we still need plumbers and we still need mechanics and we still need HVAC technicians. And there's going to be fewer of them. So they're going to be able to charge higher. So that's something to think about. You know, smart girls marry rich. I will put good resources in the show notes. Um to consider some of these things on finding the right man, cultivating good relationships and stuff, because this is really kind of the foundation of having the freedom to do sequencing, of having the freedom to be a mom. And again, another next practical step is be there for your babies, even if there's debt, even if there's that kind of thing. Like I said in the last episode, even in nations where university is publicly funded and tuition is free, the total fertility rate is still like dropping out. The bottom is falling out. So it's not debt. But be home with your babies, even if there's debt, and trust that you'll be able to work that out. You may have to live more frugally. You may have to downsize or give up some lifestyle things. Live in a smaller house. But be there with your babies. It really is good. Remember that balance is a myth, right? Be there for your babies. And know that's full time. Like mom guilt is totally hormonally driven, especially if you're trying to do two full time jobs. And I really, really, really understand this in the position that I'm in. Like I mentioned, I would like to just kind of drop the work, maybe, you know, maybe do a podcast every week because I think that it's fun, but not try and do all of the other stuff that goes with running my business because it's so stressful and I do feel torn between my children and my work. And that's not a comfortable thing. I would rather be able to record a podcast early in the morning or late at night and then be there for them during the day instead of trying to juggle work during the day. So, you know, juggling to, you know, even juggling not quite full jobs and all of that, it can be difficult. Um, I just totally agree that mothering is a full-time job and that it's really hard. And I think that, you know, and especially in today's day of remote work, moms think they're getting the best of both worlds because, oh, I can finish my job and or I can stick with my job and just work from home. But at least when you've got a little baby, you may find that that's really, really hard to do, especially if you're trying to bring in nannies and that kind of thing or even grandma. Like, you'll feel jealous that grandma is the one <laughs> taking care of the baby while you're working. And so think about those things. Consider those things. And again, some of you may already be in that situation. And it may be that you decide to make a change. And that's okay. And it may be that you're having to convince your husband to make the change. Because he's like, you know, Lee's husband that I mentioned a little while ago who is, you know, I want a boat. But consider these things. And especially talk to your daughter about these things. Don't try and have it all, all at the same time, because you can continue to learn, to grow. You can even keep up with professional connections that you may have made and still have a baby, still have your family. You can do that. You know, one of the things that we can ask ourselves is, is motherhood a stress and a burden because we've been sold the lie that we can try and do it all at the same time or that we should do it all at the same time or that in order to be a worthy woman, we need to do it all at the same time. Again, I can tell you that as a single mom, making all the decisions, that can feel liberating at times, knowing that I get to make all the decisions and I get to do that. But generally, it's not great. It, it's really tough to bear all those burdens. It would be nice to have somebody else to shoulder the burdens, including the financial burdens, bringing home the proverbial bacon. It would be nice. And so I think that... Um, you know, there is a, a sense of independence and a level of independence that comes with thinking, well, you know, I can I can work and have my own money and contribute and that kind of thing. But in the end, 
is all of the stress really worth it? I was talking to a friend to get advice on on a homeschool issue just this morning and and sharing that, you know, I want the I want math time to go smoother for my kids. They all do math, but I feel like you know, me just kind of sitting around for 45 minutes during math time feels like a waste of my time when I could be doing something else. Um, and he reflected, you know, he was like, is it really worth it? Because you're going to have stress either way. The stress of feeling like, well, I'm not getting anything done because I'm sitting here kind of making sure that everybody stays on task with math and being available if somebody's having a problem with their math so that I can address it right then instead of making them wait till later in the day when we meet one-on-one. Um, you know, there might be that stress, but there's also stress when math gets chaotic and everything else is going poorly. And so it's like, you know, what kind of stress, what stress do you want? And so this is kind of one of those situations where it's like you can't have it all, but, but, or you can't have it all, all at once that so you could have it all. And so it's like, yes, maybe you may not have quite the same level of independence or financial freedom or that sort of thing. If you're choosing to be more present for your children and even to prioritize having children, but it may be worth it. And it may be worth it to set aside some of that personal ambition and growth. And like I said before, you may find that you develop and grow in ways that you never expected because a career is not the definition of who you are either, nor is your net worth the definition of who you are, nor is your total lifetime earnings the definition of who you are, nor is this year's salary the definition of who you are. Those things are just a snapshot, and I don't know why our culture has really sold that that is it. Or rather, our culture has sold that the things that you can buy with that money are it. But, you know, it could be that motherhood is just quite fulfilling. And it could be that you enjoy juggling a little bit on the side. Like I said, even if I were to say I'm going to mostly step away from the, biz- from the business, I think I'd still do a little bit. Because I love reading and ri- reading and writing and researching on birth and, and pregnancy. And I, I do like working with clients and that kind of thing. So I might still do a little bit. But I probably wouldn't do as much as I am doing. So I don't, I don't want to carry on and on too long. But I do want to ask you to consider is mothering really a burden or is it just that we've been told that we need to juggle it all at once and so then mothering seems to be the burden but maybe it's not you know maybe the burden is that we're just just trying to do too much so Suzanne tells you to ask like what do you want your daily life to look like what do you want it to feel like do you want it to be calm and peaceful do you want to enjoy and this is a good thing if you read in um uh the life-giving home which is uh Clarkson, I can't remember her first name right now. Anyways, in the life-giving home, they talk about this too. Like, what what do you want the atmosphere to be like? Or what do you want the atmosphere of the home to be like? And in, in early years courses I've taught, I talk about that. Like, what do you want that to feel like? And and think about that. And probably if you're working full-time and trying to mother, it's, it's not going to be that way. And if you want mothering to be part of your life, then this is really important to think about. So you may not want to choose full-time remote work even if you have that opportunity and you probably do want to choose a flexible career entrepreneurship working from home again maybe not full-time doing consulting Um, for some moms teaching works well but it might work better once your children are school age if that's what you want to do but looking at a flexible career that perhaps requires a less time and education might be something to look at so just asking yourself You know, sometimes we look at the career paths that women have traditionally chosen, and those are because, A, they're less dangerous, and B, because they may offer more flexibility for women to be at home. And so this is another question you can ask your daughters and talk to your daughters about, is why don't you assume, this is what Suzanne says to do, assume that you're going to want to be a mother, and that you're going to want to take, you know, five, six, seven, eight years off, because you're going to be raising one or two or three little ones, and then what what career is a good option? Or if you're going to college, what college is a good option? Or what can you jump back into when they're at school? So those are good questions to look at. And actually, I do, I do have the author here of the book Sequencing, um, Arlene Ross and Cardozo. That's the book I mentioned earlier. So Sequencing, that book was written in the 80s. Suzanne's books are newer, written recently. So those are all good things to look at. And then there are also other resources to look at for you as parents. I'll link to um, um, pronatalism.org, which or pronatalist.org, which is the Collins' website. They have a great guide 
on tax incentives and things like that for families. I think they are mostly U.S. based right now. I don't know if they've got other countries yet, but they've got guides for the U.S. And so there are lots of resources out there for parents, and those are things I would encourage you looking at. And you can also look at scholarships for returning students and those kinds of things that will be able to help you when you're ready to jump back in. And remember that giving your kids a good life doesn't have to break the bank. So these are all kind of practical things to think about when you're asking, what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? How are you going to make it work? So think through, like think through the life that you value, that you want, what your legacy is, the legacy you want to leave when you grow. And when you're, again, this question is a good question. When you're on your deathbed, what do you think you'll value? What do you think will have made your life worth living? And when you think about the legacy that you're going to leave, and some people, you know, it may not matter to them so much. They lived their life. They had some fulfillment. They connected with friends. Maybe they feel like they impacted people that while they were here. And I respect that. But also look at the legacy that you leave in your children and your children's children. Um, and at the end, you know, will you be content with a successful career, with travel, with loads of free time? Maybe being a great pet mom, maybe that will fulfill you. Or do you want to leave a human legacy? You know, and if you do, that's a huge project, especially in today's world. And consider it a worthy project, as I argued a couple podcast episodes ago. So I think what, what leaves a legacy is a family culture filled with... Filled, he'll, he'll have to wait, baby. Speaking of my small people, they're ready for me to be out there. Um, intergenerational connections, intergenerational meaning. I really like this quote, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this quote from Simone Collins because it's just beautiful. When you think about the amount of impact you can have by building a durable culture that your children in turn pass on, the impact is incredible. And I think people also don't think about the extent to which children hedge their philosophical bets. So think about anything that you can achieve with your career. Even if you are wildly successful, your influence will largely end with your death. If you have children who in turn have children who in turn have children, you have generations of people who can have a huge impact on the future of humanity, our ability to overcome great challenges, our ability to flourish as a species and even go to other planets. It's kind of hard to imagine anything you can do in your career that would be more impactful than that. So again, I would just encourage you to talk with people about pronatalist issues, talk with people about the possibility of having babies. If you know younger women, talk with them about the reality of unplanned childlessness and that they may want to consider sequencing and anticipating that they may want to have a family. And because you cannot sequence, uh, you cannot flip-flop the sequence because of biological reality, it may be good for them to plan for that family sooner rather than later. And talk to your babies about having babies. And maybe, you know, consider having another child. There is never a good time to have a baby, but babies are always a blessing. And so think about that. Think about the legacy that you leave. Think about the growth that you yourself can have and the beautiful project that is a lovely family culture that your children want to pass on and pass on and pass on and the net positive effect for humanity in that. So with that, I will talk with you next week. We're going to swoop back into the pregnancy and especially the birth world next week, talking about birth as a rite of passage. So I cannot wait to, to talk with you. That will be episode number 200, and I'm really looking forward to it. Definitely check today's show notes. They are going to be packed. Talk soon.